Okay, so we'll talk about induced, uh, uh, how about induced current, well, induced EMF and current. Um, so, in general, we can say E is induced by IFF, I mean, if and only if, I mean, that math person was said that to me and stuck with me, if and only if what? According to, um, there's a law that we call Faraday's law. The EMFs are only induced if something happens. Changing what? Well, well, change in flux, right? So we're talking about the, the, the input was if there's a change in B, oh, if there's a change in area, well, those things are the components of what we call magnetic flux. All right, so E is induced if and only if um, phi changes over time. Or really, we can say that EMF is delta phi over delta T. So what is this thing that we call flux? Well, we said that flux, by definition, is... Yeah. Be a cosine theta, or what we really mean, what I like to say is be a parallel. You need the proponent of what we call the area vector parallel to um, magnetic field, or the component of the magnetic field that's parallel to what we call the magnetic, sorry, the component of the magnetic field that's parallel to what we call the area vector. So, one thing we did say is that if we have a loop like this, remember what the area vector looks like? It's way what we call normal to the well to the plane of the loop, right? So here's a right angle like this. Okay. So <clears throat> for there to be flux, we need well. If I had a magnetic field that looked like this. Is there flux now? So, sure. See if I can take this. Oops. 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 Oh, I can do that, I suppose. Is there flux now? Maximum flux, exactly. What I should do, let me, let me glue to these things. Can I do that? Yeah. Yeah, so maximum flux now, right? Some flux now. How much now? None, right? So what you can really think about is how much of the field cuts through the loop. How many of those lines, you know, literally go through the enclosed area, right? So in this case, none. And again, look at the, look at the angle between magnetic field and our area vector. It's 90, right? The, whoops, the cosine of 90 is 0. Okay, so in this case we do area is pi r squared, right? Lots of times if it's just a rectangular loop, um, you know, we can do uh, just 10 times this. Okay, um, so, you know, in one case to change flux, whoops, oh yeah, how about this? What if we do this? Flux change? No. What if we do, um, what if we do this? Flux change? Well, sure, if it goes, so how about this, flux change? No. If some, well, how about this, flux change? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so, right, look at how many lines go through the loop. In this case, there's, you know, some, and there's the same amount, there's the same amount going through the loop, no matter where we go in here. But if we do this, now there are less lines going through there. So if we know, literally, you know, how much flux there is now, how long it takes to get out to here, now there's zero flux, we could find our change in flux. If we know how long that took, we could find the induced EMF. Okay? Yeah, so what about, the question was, what about when there's N? What does N refer to, Meg? Yeah, so we could say instead of, instead of just one um, loop of wire here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we 
you have n loops of wire. Well, that means we just put, really, I'm glad you brought that up, n be a cosine of theta there. Number of loops. All right, so we've seen examples like, uh, um, got a field like this. Right, and then we take a loop of wire um, like this. Let's call this length. Let's call that width. Let's call this B. And, you know, if we take this this uh, loop of wire, and let's see, we start to have it exit the field. Here's where flux starts to change, right? Not changing now, agreed? No EMF now. But now, as this thing starts to exit the field, we go from having what I call, well, lots of inward flux, or lots of flux from magnetic lines that point in, magnetic field lines that point in. Now we have less magnetic flux from field lines that point in. And now eventually we have no magnetic flux from magnetic field lines that point in. So we've changed magnetic flux. All right. So the one thing we can do is, you know, we can, if we know how long that took, right, we can say that the EMF is delta phi over delta T or N times length times width over delta T. Now what I kind of did is skip the step here. What I recommend you do is do this phi final minus phi initial. Right, because sometimes it'll go from, um, you know, it could go from, no, it's not always, one of them isn't always zero. In our case right here, you know, this phi final is zero. I did this wrong, didn't I? We need, what else do we need up here? Of course, we need a B here. Right? So our phi final is zero. So if we knew n l w t you know, over t, if we knew you know what t was, we could find our new EMF. All right. Um, but there's another way to do that. Go ahead, John. Before we, before we talk about the other way to do that. Yeah, so, good question. So the, if we do this, the question was, how do we calculate the area of the loop if the, if the loop's like that, right? Half in the field and half out. Well, the area, the only area that we care about now is this area here. So it's really the area, it's not necessarily the area of the loop, it's the area of the loop that contains magnetic field. Okay? That's the question. Now, this is going to be, this is going to throw a couple people for a loop, I think, but there's another way to write an expression for EMF here, right? Because we have B here, and then we have, well, this is what? It's how fast this thing moves, right? This L divided by T is how fast this thing moves. So we can write that as, B times the speed of the wire, but for us, what will we put in? Well, we keep this W, right? This is the W that we're talking about. You'll see this. We, you know, before we didn't write it as BVW, we wrote it as BVL. So my choice of of parameters for this loop was was not ideal. Okay. Because when we say BVL, that is important to know. I mean, which wire do we care about? Do we care about the length of this thing or the length of this thing? Well, we care about the length of that one because that's the one that's cutting across magnetic field lines as this thing moves. Okay? If we look at any one of these wires, if we look at wire, let's call it one, wire two, 
wire 3 or wire 4, as this thing is exiting the field, if we do a right hand rule thing, literally for a charge in, well, I don't know, 1 or 3, the charges are moving to the right, right? In a field that points in. So in wire 3, the charges are pushed upward. That will not induce a current in, in wire 3, right? Same thing in wire 1. The charges are moving right in a field that points in. Wire 1 is also pushed upward. So the charges in it are pushed upward. That doesn't induce a current in wire 1. But the charges in wire 4, woo, wire 4, right, they are moving to the right in a field that points in. So the charges in wire 4 are pushed up, and that does induce a current in wire 4. Therefore, the dimension that we care about when we talk about BV, L is the length of the wire that's cutting across here. You get what I'm saying? That wire two, or sorry, that wire one and three don't cut across magnetic field lines. But wire four and wire wire two do cut across field lines. Well, two and four. Well, right now. Um, well, I'm sorry, I should say that right now, four, they're not, right? It's not moving through the field. So it's really only two that the lines are, that the, that the wire is cutting across magnetic field lines. Okay? So there would be, you know, the induced current right now would be in this one, would go that way. Right? Therefore, current in this thing has got to go like that. The only time that four induced current is when, yeah, was when we did this. Four induces current, four induces current, there's no current, there's no current, there's no current. Two induces current, two induces current, two induces, there's no current, there's no current. Okay? Now, suddenly we've gone from talking about inducing EMF to inducing current, right? EMF is the same as voltage, potential difference. Right? So we can get to the next part where we say the connection between induced current <coughs> and induced EMF is yeah, we call that moment loss. Right? So if this thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not keep monkeying up that diagram, but you know, typically in an example like this, we wouldn't have just a plain old loop of wire. What we'd have is maybe something like this, right, with a resistance R that's moving through this field. Okay? So this is called Faraday's Law, the EMFs are induced when and if magnetic flux changes, right? And then there's another law that talks about the direction of those, or the direction of induced currents that are a result of induced EMF. And the direction of those induced currents comes from the law that we call Lenz's Law. Right? Anyone want to talk about Lenz's Law? <laughs> I will, I'll start you off. Um, induced Currents flow in a direction that, yeah, um, keeps magnetic flux constant, or I should say, by constant. So if we look at our example up here, whoops, yeah, our example up here, as we do this, what I say is the amount of flux from field lines that point in gets smaller. So I say as we do this, there's less inward flux, that's how I say it, right? So the induced magnetic field, sorry, yeah, the, sorry, the induced current tries to make more inward flux. If we're losing magnetic flux from field lines that point in, 
we try to make more magnetic flux than lines of point in. And that means that the magnetic field inside the loop has to point inward. So what we do is we point our thumb inward, and then our fingers wrap in the direction of the induced current, and that is clockwise, which agrees with what we said here, that the induced current does have to go that way. All right, what's nice about this is we don't need to go through that whole Lenz's Law thing. You can just do the plain old right-hand rule for Y or 2. How do I get, come on, there we go. Right, we can just do the, the right-hand rule for Y or 2 as we do this, but certainly we can also explain it with our Lenz's Law. Yes, the current will turn around. Um, let's see. If we do this, let's take another field. Goofy group. So we start with this loop here. Um, when we enter the field, now we're getting more inward flux, right? So what I always do is, you know, I, what you might want to say is, so the magnetic, the induced current tries to make less inward flux, but I instead of that just say more outward flux. So I point my thumb out, my fingers wrap in the direction of current. So as this thing is entering the field, how do I draw that the best? So I'll say if it's doing this right here, here's V, and the induced, let's see, sorry, more outward flux, the induced current goes like that. Okay? As we do this over here, boom, and this thing is now exiting the field at that speed V. Well, now it was like what we said before, now there's less inward flux than you want, more inward flux, so this thing now, induced current goes that way. So it does change direction. And what I neglected to say, of course, was when this thing is in the middle, doing this, there's what now? None. None at all. No current, no, no induced EMF. Okay? So yes, it will absolutely change direction. Now, here's the other thing we didn't talk about is as this thing enters the field, what does the field do to the loop? It pushes it. What direction? Well, it's not up or down. It pushes it back. Because here's the deal. If we, if we look at, let's look at this wire, right? As that wire moves this way, we look at a charge in that wire, right? And we always talk about conventional current, positive charge flow. Um, as this charge moves through this field, uh, let's see, going right, field in, this thing is pushed upward. It makes current go that way. But what is that current flow? Well, that's a new direction of charge velocity. So now we put our thumb up and our fingers into the field, and the field pushes the loop back in the direction it came from. All right, so we call this the magnetic force on the wire. And what that says is you can't get something for nothing, right? We had a question before where we put this loop on a cart, right? A frictionless cart, or a cart with frictionless bearings, or something like that, right? And as this thing rolls into the field, we have mechanical energy of the cart's motion, but now we end up with some electrical energy because we have current flowing, right? If we put a light bulb in here, that light bulb lights up. We turn mechanical energy into light heat energy. Right? And you can't keep the same amount of mechanical energy. This thing has to slow down. And how does it do that? It does that because the field pushes it and makes it slow down. Right? And that comes from something we call back EMF. 
or it's an explanation of something that we call a back to the end. Right? It would be great if we could just take a cart, roll it through a field, and make a light light up. And it just keeps, you know, the cart just keeps rolling at the same speed, and light happens, great. Right? But again, we can't get something stood up. We have to exchange some of that mechanical energy for the light and the heat energy to serve the light bulb. Yeah? How does that feel for flux and stuff? Good? 